I'm Gigi Arnetta reporting for InfoWars Nightly News. And today I have a witness that was not necessarily at the the scene of the Michael Hastings accident, but at the scene after it happened. So thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you. I really wanted to ask you some questions about the crime scene and what you were able to see. I understand that you were inside the house because you were not allowed to be outside, that the police made you stay in the house. Can you tell, a little, tell us a little bit about that? Well, we were at the scene uh, right when it happened, right after the impact, because we were woken up. It was right in front of our house. And we were outside up until uh, the coroner got into, see, uh, into the scene. And then at that point, we were asked to go inside. So I went inside and I uh, then went on my balcony, which uh, was facing the scene. And they asked me to go away from my balcony into the house. So I was able to observe it from the window. Which is actually a, a pretty decent view, right? Because you're above everything. It, it, yes, exactly. It was a good view. They were trying to spread the white linens from the coroner's van to block my view. But nevertheless, I had the corner where I could see pretty much everything. Okay, well, okay. Let's, let's start from the beginning. You were asleep when it happened. What did it sound like? And was there any light coming through the windows? Okay, so my uh, bedroom window facing the scene, and my bed is right, right under that window. So I was woken up for, uh, with the loud uh, bang or boom, simultaneously with the big flush, huge flush, to the point that my whole room was like a daylight even though through the, through the heavy curtains. So before I even got off the bed, I moved the curtain and I saw the what I assumed was the car. I couldn't even see if it was a car, but I assumed it was the car completely engulfed in flames. So you heard, you heard a sound that sounded like a boom. Did it shake the house at all? Not, not that I remember, no. It did not shake the house. It was a boom and flash. And we both, me and my husband, jumped off the bed. He put on his slippers and ran downstairs um, and screamed to me, uh, call 911. And uh, he, by the time I put on my rope and came out uh, while dialing 911, he was already uh, turned on the hose and was trying to put the flames down. So when you heard the boom, how... You jumped out of the bed, so it was just a few seconds, and you went to the window. It was already on fire, right? It was on fire uh, simultaneously with the impact. Okay. And how big would you say that fire was? As big as you see it on all the uh, videos that you see on YouTube and everywhere. Uh, it was like this from the start. It started like that. Okay. So really instantaneously there was a fire. Instant. Okay. And then as time passed, how long did it take for the fire department and the police to get there? From my call to the fire uh, department, it was between three and four minutes. Okay, which is pretty fast in LA. Very fast. I think it's five minutes. And uh, so maybe tops five minutes. What was the first thing that they did when they got there? Uh, the first the, one of the fires, uh, well, while they were unpacking the equipment, unrolling the hoses, one a fireman looked into the driver's side. And they, you even could see him on the videos where he's just uh, like kind of looking at it, uh, resigned, seeing that there's no rush, uh, that whoever is there, uh, it's too late to save him. And therefore, at that point, they were, there was no... Uh, rush in their movements. They, I mean, they were putting out the fire and it took them about 30 seconds of their hoses uh, with the pressure that they have to put it out. But they were not, they, they saw that they were not saving anybody. Did you see anything in the car at that point? Could you see from your view? You could absolutely could not see. In fact, when I called 911, they asked me, do you see people in the car? And I said, no, there is, I cannot see anything in the car. I can see the car itself. It was a ball of flame. And, and so when the police got there and the, and the firemen were there, they were trying to put the fire out, 
Tell us a little bit about when the coroner got there. Okay, the coroner got there at 7.30. That was three hours after the accident. And the coroner, uh, there were two cars. There was a regular car and a van. There were two lady coroners. Um, one of them was coroner investigator, another just coroner. There were signs on their backs. Uh, one Korean, I have assumed, Oriental, and one uh, Latina. And there were like slight ladies, so I was just thinking, my God, how are they going to go ahead with this task? Right. And um, at that point, um, there was a fire department on the scene, but not the one that put out the fire. It was another fire uh, department that was uh, that had equipment to cut the cars with the jaws of life and uh, chains and all kind of stuff like that. And um, what they did was they first cut out. Um, they had the I think they had the generator with them. They plugged in the electric uh, tools. They cut out the car. Um, I think the whatever was left of the front bumper and the back and the all side panel of uh, the, from the driver's side. Then they chained the front of the car to the palm tree, the back of the car to the fire truck. Right. They backed the fire truck to unfold the car like accordion. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, got to get him out. So two firemen got him out. And at that point, um, the coroners took over the body. Okay, so back to getting the jaws of life out. You said they had to basically saw into the car. What, when the fire was finally put out, and, I, and I'm guessing they got it completely out before they started to... Oh, no, no. Okay, so 4.30 is, 4.20, 4.30 is the accident. The car, uh, five minutes later, they only seen the, the fires put out within 30 seconds. So by 4.35, the fire was out. Now we're talking coroner on the scene at 7.30, three hours later. The body was in the car without any fire for three hours. <laughs> For three, for these three hours, a bunch of uh, police cars and the detective and the supervisor of the police were all around the block, uh, measuring, uh, taping, um, taking pictures, taking videos. There was a separate photographer from the police, uh, designated by the police photographer, taking all kinds of pictures from all kinds of angles. Uh, there was a detective who was not in a police uniform there uh, supervising the whole thing. There was a supervisor of the police force in the police uniform supervising the policemen. Uh, so it was uh, for three hours they were working on that before they even touched the body. Now, when you were looking at this whole scene, there was a lot of debris. I know I saw it in the videos, Orla. How yes. far would you say the debris went? Did it reach from... Melrose down to Clinton, which is the next it, little block it, it, or further? Absolutely, till Clinton. In fact, the transmission was at the corner of Clinton. Did that strike you strange that it went that far? Not at that point, but looking back, absolutely. Yeah, it was pretty it's far. Two people. For me, for me, it wasn't strange. Okay, my <laughs> husband and uh, me, we are completely on a different uh, angle to so this story. For me, I didn't think it's this strange at all. It, my, it's completely, uh, it's, uh, if a car is flying from the uh, north to south, and it's all debris, it's most of the car parts, it was in the, uh, in the way from north to south. Okay, so on Highland, right? It's most, it's most of the part it was uh, in one in one way. Yeah, one direction. Uh, how how the car it was driving, in the same way it was all the parts flying. Fl flying. Were you able to see any kind of deb debris trail from the engine transmission piece that was near Clinton? Was there a trail? A Fuel no. trail, anything? No, it wasn't. No. It no. flew. It's fly. All yeah. the part it was flying. It's it was, it... yeah. Nothing dragged. It flew. <laughs> it flew. No, no, it was, it, uh, probably, uh, uh, probably transmission, it was, it was flying because it's very smooth and it's probably from the force. It's, it's probably, it was uh, skidding uh, on the part. 
There was no signs of skidding anywhere on the, str on yeah, the street. Yeah, but it's a smooth, it's smooth metal part. It's okay, it's fine. Not so that's where we disagree. <laughs> now, I was there and I saw the street. Uh, of course, it was not when it happened, but I was there uh, earlier in the last uh, week. And I noticed there were no marks on the street itself, uh, yep. no marks on the curb. It, it really it was fascinating that there weren't even there wasn't even even a crack on the curb no, where the, the car had hit. Uh, the water pipes that were there before the tree, mm -hmm. those were broken. And you could actually see where it had been, I guess, severed. Right, he knocked down the fire hydrant and uh, the box, there was a metal box around it, around standing about two feet up. And that was completely mangled and that frame was also on the corner of Clinton. And you said it was mangled in... Completely, yeah, like screwed the metal. It was like made of the metal uh, chain link kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was completely uh, destroyed. Security bars. Yeah, kind of like a security frame for that uh, hydra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was completely also bent all in all places, just completely out of shape. Now, some of the footage that's there from that night shows the car in the front end of the car. Some of it is already, it, well, it looks like it's missing. And this is before they put, obviously, it's on fire. So before they put the sheet and everything over it, did you see anything in the front of the car? Any, like as far as the tire or anything, was there anything there you could see? Okay, so what shows missing, it's actually, I did not leave this scene. So if you think that they, somebody took something away from this scene, no. Okay. That's it was bent in. Okay, so everything that's there is there. It's there, yes. Okay. Nobody, nobody took any parts of the, nobody, you know, cut the piece of the car and put it away. I was there from the minute it happened to the minute they towed the car away. Okay, so okay. when they actually got the got the jaws of life out, they saw it in the door on the left side where the where the driver's side is, but they yes. didn't do anything else to the other side and, and they pulled it apart basically with the fire truck. They basically, yeah, they basically cut it apart, put it apart. All the pictures were taken uh, mm -hmm. by police before that. And then they got Hastings out of the car. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so, um, so when I when I tell about that, I just have to preface it with the fact that I was they were trying their best not to let me see it. Right. So whatever I did see uh, could have been you know kind of like a, it was hard to see. Right. What I saw, I expected after that fire to see basically body in pieces and completely black. And what I saw is the full body. This completely black face, completely uh, burnt face, up to the, let's say, shoulders. But from shoulders down, I saw the whole body, which was completely intact, not burned in any way. I didn't know who it was. But when I saw it, I told my daughter, it's a white guy, uh, about 25 to 30, I told her. It's a white young guy. And uh, I'm still like doubting, like, could I see it? But I'm thinking, how possibly could I know that it's a white guy and he's 25 to 30 if I did not see the completely white arms, not burned in any way, not touched. And from what I saw, he was wearing uh, something like a T-shirt and what I saw, the gray color, but it could have been gray from smoke. I don't know what it started as. And f as far as I could see, it was cut off sleeves because I saw full white arms. I even paid attention that it was like I thought to myself, my God, in California, the guy is so white, so not tan. <laughs> But okay. now I think it's a dead body. It's right. No, and it was and it was seven ish when all this happened, right? It was seven twenty to seven forty. So you have pretty good daylight at that point. Yeah, it's a completely light. Okay. And so they put him uh, on the grass. They spread the white sheet on the grass and they put him flat on his back. And the coroners went around uh, doing whatever they were doing. I could not see they were kneeling in front of him or like squatting in front of him, two coroner ladies. And then one of them pulled him by the arm to lift him on the side, to roll him on the side and checked something in the back, what I assume is back pocket of his pants to see for ID. 
Okay. So I clearly saw not only was the skin not burned, it was completely intact. You could have moved the body by the arms. But they found his ID, I guess, in his pocket? It, uh, did they find it? I don't know. Okay. I saw the, I saw the movement of the body being crawled on the side, mm -hmm. being uh, pulled by one of the arms, and one of the coroners going into the back of his uh, lower part of the body. So I would assume it looked to me like a back pocket of the of the. Were they looking for ID? That's my assumption. Right. Right. All right. Well, I just want to thank you so much for um, allowing us to talk to you. Absolutely. And God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. And that was a witness from the Michael Hastings scene. So there's a lot to think about there. I'm Gigi Giornetta with the InfoWars Nightly News. ProPure is introducing Pro One. All of your filtration in one system, portable, on the go. This is the Pro One by ProPure. You wanted it, you got it. No more do you have two or three filters to just reduce sodium fluoride. You have a system that cuts out the sodium fluoride and up to 95% of hydrofluorosilicic acid. Advanced manufacturing technology combines silver impregnated white ceramic with new Aquamedics Advanced Media for removal of fluoride and other heavy metals, all in one filter element. It cuts out the acid derivative of fluoride. It is the only one that does it. And out of the gates, we have it discounted at 10% off with promo code WATER. This is the only system that in one unit helps reduce or remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, ammonia, and chlorine, hydrofluorosilicic acid, the most common form of fluoride not covered by other fluoride filter brands, and sodium hexafluorosilicate. This is a revolution against the tyrants. They love putting the toxic acid base of fluoride into your water. They love the fact that it's an adjuvant supercharging the trace Prozac in the water and the hormones and the other chemicals. By cutting out fluoride, you cut out the turbocharger in all the poison being artificially introduced into your body. This is what I use. It's a win-win. You get a high quality product at the lowest price. You support the info war. Get your Pro Pure with the new Pro One filter today at InfoWarsStore.com or by calling 888 253 3139.